In this video, I want to take a look at building a third person controller with Unity's new input system. If you're new to the new input system, you might want to check out my earlier video where I went into more depth about the system itself, whereas this video is going to be more of an application of that system. In addition to using the new input system, we're also going to be looking at creating an animator, importing animations, doing some basic melee attack, and using Cinemachine to create a third person camera controller. So what you can see here on my computer screen here is I've got a low poly scene and the majority of these assets came from a developer called Just Create. I've used a bunch of their assets in my videos and Odin videos. I really like their work. I think it looks really nice. It's really well put together. The uh, character that I'll be using is a tiny toony person, also a um, asset store asset. So the first thing that we need to do with creating our third person controller is create our input action assets. And I'm going to do that here in my input settings folder. I'm going to right click create input actions. And I'm going to call this third person actions, actions asset, like so. Then I'm going to press here in the inspector, the edit asset button to open up this window, like so. So I'm going to create a new action map. I'm going to call it player. We're only going to have one action map in this case. We've got one action here. I'm going to rename this to move using both a gamepad and a mouse and keyboard. So we're going to be making bindings for each of those. So if there's a move binding, the first one I'm going to add in, I'm going to listen and I'm going to wiggle the gamepad stick. Now I'm only getting directions on the stick. It's okay. I'm going to select one of those and then press the T. I'm going to edit this down like so. There are ways to get around that, but that also works pretty well. Then to add in the WASD keys, I'm going to right click here, the top here, and I'm going to choose add 2D vector composite. Now, if you hit the plus next to it, that's not going to give you that option. It's only available in the right click. And I'm going to name that WASD. Then I'm going to add in the bindings. Like so. So the next action we're going to add in is a jump action. All that jump. And again, we're going to add a binding this time with a button. And we get two options here. I'm using an Xbox controller, so I get A, but I can also choose a button south, which is going to work for any controller. And then I'm going to add in another binding keyboard like so. Next, I'm going to add in an attack. And I'm not really sure what a good key on the keyboard uh, is. I'm just going to add in a control because that's where my left hand is. That'll work for me. And then the last one we're going to add in is a look uh, action. And what this is going to do is control our Cinemachine camera. So when we move the mouse or when we move the right joystick on our gamepad, the camera will rotate around us. But we do need to make a few changes here to the action type. We need to change it from a button to a pass through and then the control type to a vector two. And in our binding and click on the path, listen. And in this case, when I move the right stick, I get exactly the right stick. And that's because we're assigning it to the pass through setting. We need to add one more binding to it. And in this case, I need to search for a mouse delta. And that's going to be the change in our mouse position, not the overall position of our mouse, but the change in the mouse position. And there you go. You can definitely add more actions to this depending on what you're trying to do. But that's going to give us the basis of a third person controller. Now, one thing that always catches me out with the uh, creating these input action assets is saving it. I right now have auto save clicked. If you don't have that clicked, you'll see a save button over here. Mine's grayed out because it's autom been automatically saved, but you can click that and save it. The reason you might not want to use auto save is because once we generate a C sharp script, you can get some lag when you change something in the UI. If you change one of these actions or an action map, uh, as soon as you do that, Unity tries to regenerate the C sharp code and you can get kind of a laggy behavior. Not going to be a problem for me, so I'm going to leave it as autosave. I'm going to come over here with the action asset selected. In the inspector, we can see this generate C sharp class toggle and turn that on. And for me, these default settings are great. I'm going to press apply. And you can see here we now have a new C sharp class. And this is going to have all the events that we're going to be subscribing to. And this is all the nice controls so we can interface with our custom C sharp code. Now you can open this up, it's just a, a C sharp class. But there's not really any need, and I guess it's probably not a great idea to go in there and change anything as it's already been generated uh, for you by Unity. With the input action asset created, we next need to create our player controller code. So I'm going to create a new class. I'm going to call it, call it third person controller, and we'll open that up. 
First thing we need to do here is add in a new namespace, Unity Engine dot input system, like so. And then I'm going to get rid of both my start and my update. I'm not really going to make use of them. Then we're going to need to put in a few uh, fields. Most importantly here, we need our third person actions asset. This is what we just created in Unity. And I'm going to call this player actions asset like so. And then we're going to, I'm going to create a input action. And this is one of the main reasons we needed to add in that library. So we have access to this class. I'm going to call this move. And this is going to store a reference to the move action. And that's just going to make our code cleaner and easier to read. You can do this for all your actions if you want to, but I find that it's most useful for things like move, which I'm going to be pulling as opposed to subscribing to events. Then we're going to create a bunch of movement fields and here we're going to be using the uh, physics engine. So we're going to have a rigid body. I'm going to serialize a bunch of values so we can access them in the inspector. If we need, we're going to have a movement force. So this is just, since we're, again, we're using the physics engine, this is how hard we're pushing on the rigid body. Then we're going to have a jump force. This is how much we're going to be jumping. I'm going to set it to like five. And then we're going to have a max speed. I really like to put this in here since we're using the physics engine, we're applying a force to the object, which effectively means we're generate generating acceleration. And if we just keep pushing, pushing, we'll go faster and faster. So we wouldn't be able to limit that maximum speed. Last variable for our movement is going to be a vector three, which is a force direction. Uh, this is just going to allow us to cache the direction uh, of the force for a given uh, input. I'm going to initialize it at vector 3.0. The last field is going to be a reference to our camera. And the reason we want to do this is because we want our motion to be relative to our camera uh, position. So meaning when I push forward on the gamepad or push W on the keyboard, we want the player to walk away from the camera, not in some arbitrary direction set up, set up by the, um, the axes in our scene. And let's just, the player's not aware of that. It's not going to make for a good feeling controller. Then in an awake function, we're going to initialize things. So, or rather we're going to grab references to the rigid body like so. And then we are going to initialize this player actions asset. We need to create a new instance of it. I'm just going to do it like that. Now, if you've watched my video on changing action maps, I did this differently. And that method that I applied in that uh, video should work perfectly fine with this approach. Uh, I just want to keep things neat and tidy and as simple as possible for what's already going to be a fairly long video or next thing we need to do is we need to subscribe to um, our uh, input events. In this case, the only event we're going to subscribe to at this point is our uh, jump event. So the way we access that is we do player actions asset player, which is our action map. And then we go to jump. Now this itself is not the event. Uh, we have three choices of events. We have a started canceled and uh, performed. In this case, I think started is going to work great. So I'm going to add a do jump function to it like so. And then while I remember, I'm going to copy that entire function. I'm going to change this to on disable and we're going to unsubscribe. Now this prevents any sort of edge cases where the player object might get turned off and then back on. Maybe you have a respawn, something like that. We only want this script to be subscribed to that um, jump started event once with, uh, that, so that when we press the spacebar, we're not double jumping or anything like that. Now we need to do two more things here in the on enable function before I forget. First is we're going to grab a reference to our move action. And when we do that through our player action asset, player.move. And again, that's just going to keep our code cleaner, simpler um, as we make our way through this. And then the last thing we need to do here is turn on our action map. So I'm going to do player actions asset player. And I want to do enable, not enabled, which is a property. We want to do enable, which is a function. And then if you like for uh, symmetry or what have you, you can copy that down onto the on disable and you can disable that action map. Now we've got this error here with the do jump function because it's not defined. So I'm going to have Visual Studio do that for me like so. And the reason I like to have Visual Studio do that is to make sure that I get the correct input parameter. I'm not having to search around what type needs to go into it. So let's flesh out this jump function and then we'll come back to the overall movement. In the jump function, first thing we want to do, we want to check if we're grounded. 
And the reason we want to do that is we only want to jump if we are on the ground or on some other object. We don't want to be continuously jumping up and up and up. And if that is true, if we are grounded, we're going to add to our force direction. And the way we're going to do this is vector three up, all right, plus jump force like that. And then we need to create this is grounded function. And inside this function, we're going to do some ray casting just to check and see if there's something directly below us. So we're going to create a new ray. And what we're going to do is take the position or we're going to define the origin or where this ray starts. We're going to take the position of this object and then we're going to add a little bit vector up plus some small amount. And what this is doing is just ensuring that we're going to be ray casting from above whatever object or surface that our player is sitting on. And then we're going to define the direction, which is vector three down like that. Then we're going to do our ray cast, physics, ray cast, ray. Then we're going to define um, our ray cast hit, like so. We do it inline, which is a newer feature of C sharp, or at least the version, the newer feature of the version that's in Unity. And then we're going to define how far we shoot this ray. And we're not going to go very far. We want to go just a little bit further than we raised up our origin. That way we, we just we know pretty precisely if we're actually standing on some ground. And if we are, if we do hit something, we're going to return true, else we return false. Now, if you want to be more precise with what, you, what you've hit, maybe you want to check the tag of it, maybe you want to check the object, you can only jump off certain things, you can add in more logic. But for my purposes, this is going to work just great. And with that, our, our jump is more or less complete. We are going to make some tweaks to the uh, downward motion of our jump to get rid of some floatiness uh, that's pretty inherent when you're using the physics engine. Uh, but we're going to do that in the fixed update after we get our movement put together. So let's build up our fixed update function. And this is where most of our actions actually going to happen. And in here, what we're doing is we're building up again this force uh, direction. And then we're going to be applying that force to our rigid body. The first thing we're going to do is force direction plus equals. And we're going to grab the input from our move action. So we get move dot read value. And we're going to be reading a vector two. And in this case, I just want the X direction. And the reason we want to do that is because we, again, we want our motion to be relative to the camera. So I'm going to take the magnitude or the size of the X uh, direction. I'm going to multiply it by this get camera right function. That's going to take in the player camera like so. And we'll define this function in just a bit. We're then going to do the same thing, but we're going to do it in the vertical. So read value vector to y get camera forward. And again, taking in the player camera like so. Let's get these two things defined like so. And you'll note here that uh, when Visual Studio created them, they had the wrong return type. So let's change those to vector three. So you might be asking, why don't we just use transform.forward or transform.right? Well, the reason for that is, is that our camera can be tipped and most likely is tipped and looking down at our player, could even be tipped side to side. So that means that the forward and the right are not necessarily in the horizontal plane. And we want to be able to move our player in that horizontal plane. Uh, and these functions are going to take the projection of that forward and right direction and project them onto the horizontal plane, which sounds maybe fancy, but it's not really all that fancy. So I'm going to define a new vector forward, and this is going to be player camera transform forward like so. And then we're going to take the uh, Y component of that and set it equal to zero. And then we're going to return forward uh, normalized. And the reason we're normalizing that is because once we take off that vertical component, the length of it's no longer one. And we don't want our speed or our movement to depend on the angle of that camera. Meaning if you made it really steep, you were looking straight down, potentially uh, when you remove the vertical component, your vector could be a length zero or really short. We don't want to do that. And then I copy all that, paste that into the get camera right. I'm going to rename my variable so it's more readable. And then change this to from forward to right, like so. So that's going to work but it doesn't allow us to change or tune the speed of our player. So we're going to add in one more uh, element to each of these lines, and we're going to multiply by our movement force, movement force like so. Then when that's all done, we're going to apply this force 
to our rigid body, like so. And we need to give, define a force mode. I find that the impulse force mode works most intuitively how I expect it to be working. After we do that, I'm gonna reset the force direction to zero. This uh, does a few things for us, um, but mostly it means that when we let go of our gamepad or we stop pressing buttons, our player's not gonna continue to accelerate uh, and will allow our player to come to a stop. The next thing we're gonna do is to deal with the jump. Now, if you've made a jump in Unity, it's really easy, right? We just did it in a few lines, but it tends to be really floaty, especially if you're doing something where the player can jump any significant portion of their height or multiples of their own height. Now, what I'm gonna do here is pretty simple and it's not the end all be all. It's not gonna make the best jump. If you wanna make a really good jump, I'd recommend get out there. Uh, Gamma Sutra's got a, some great articles on different jump mechanics and how to implement them and the pros and cons of them. But this typically gets away from, uh, or removes the worst of the floatiness. And what we're gonna do here is when our player is falling down, we're going to accelerate them faster. So they come back down to the ground quicker. It tends to get rid of that floatiness. And the way we're gonna do that, is gonna check if the vertical component of the rigid body's velocity is less than zero. So if it's negative, then we're going down. If that's true, we're then gonna take the rigid body's velocity and set it equal to, or actually we're gonna to add to it, vector three down, multiply that by the gravity, or more particularly the vertical component of gravity, and then multiply that by time, fixed delta time. And again, fixed delta time because we're in the fixed update, uh, not the regular update. So what we're essentially doing here, uh, it's a little bit of a physics nerd that I am, what we're doing here is we're increasing the acceleration as we fall, but in no other places. You'll see a lot of people recommend that you up the gravity in your world, and you double it, works pretty well. And that does help a little bit, but this really helps here because now our player is gonna fall faster and we're not affecting everything in our scene when we do that. The next thing we need to do is we need to cap our speed. We don't wanna have our player running super, super infinitely fast. So we need to cap our velocity. And that's a little tricky here, what I'm gonna be capping is the horizontal speed, not the vertical speed. So if you jump off a building, I don't really care how fast you slam into the ground. If you do care in your game and you wanna limit the, um, the vertical velocity as well, you'll need to do something similar, but for my purposes, this is gonna be great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a new vector three, horizontal velocity. And for now, it's gonna be just the rigid body velocity. I'm then gonna remove or set the vertical component of that to zero so we only have horizontal velocity. And then I'm gonna check the magnitude or more particularly, I'm gonna check the square magnitude of this. And I'm gonna ask, is this bigger than max speed times max speed? Now, if that seems strange and you haven't seen this before, uh, when we do a magnitude, we have to do a square root and square roots are particularly slow for computers. But Squaring something or multiplying something by itself, so max speed times max speed, is quick and easy. Uh, so we get the exact same result. This is just a little bit easier to do. If that's true, meaning we've exceeded our max speed in the horizontal direction, I'm going to set the rigid body velocity to our horizontal velocity. I'm going to normalize it, multiply it by max speed. So that way we're not slowing down. If we're at max velocity or just slightly above it, we set it back to our max velocity. But then we need to add back in the vertical component. So if we're falling or jumping, we don't stop and just float in midair. So what I'm gonna do is add in vector three up, and I'm gonna multiply that by the rigid body velocity in the Y direction. And so with that, we should have enough to go test our controller. So back here in Unity, on our player, we need to add in a few things. We're gonna add in a rigid body. And we're also gonna add in a capsule collider. Now, I like the capsule collider because it's rounded at the bottom. So if we run into a curb or a step, we don't just smack into it and try to tip over. We have a tendency to kind of lift up. But we do need to make some adjustments to this. I'm gonna get a side view, go into orthographic mode so I can line this up uh, better than I can in regular mode. So I'm gonna stretch it out so it's more or less a shape. I'm gonna stretch it up and then I'm trying to get the bottom of that capsule collider to be right about at his feet. I think that's good enough for now. On the rigid body, we're gonna make a few changes here particularly in the freeze rotation. I'm gonna freeze it on the X and the Z direction. And that's gonna prevent our capsule from tipping over, but still allow it to rotate on the vertical axes. Then of course we need to add in our third person controller like so. 
and we need to make sure to drag and drop our camera into the correct slot on that script. If we don't put that in there, we're going to get a null reference. It's not going to work. If I now go into play mode to give this a quick test, I can move my player around with my keyboard. Uh, you'll notice a few things. I'm really drifting my hands off the keyboard and it's really drifting. Other thing, if I hit something, I'll start rotating just kind of and continue rotating, which are definitely a problem. Uh, and we're going to fix both of those issues. First one is we're going to up the drag here. One of the reasons our player is just like sliding along is because there's no drag. So I'm going to turn it up to 3.5, which is a value that I think works pretty well. It's going to depend on the mass and the force and all that. You're going to have to tune it like any other physics object. But the last remaining problem is this weird rotation. And so what we need to do is set up our player so that it's looking in the direction that it's moving and not just allowing the physics engine to rotate it wherever it wants to go. So let's go back into Visual Studio and we're going to create a new function to control which direction we are looking. I'm going to call this function look at. What we're going to do here is basically whenever uh, the player is giving it some input and we're moving, we're going to change the direction and look the direction that we are moving. So I'm going to create a new vector three and call this direction. And this is going to be, it's going to start off as the direction of the velocity. And then going to make the vertical component of that zero, because again, we don't want our player to be looking up or down. Uh, we just want them to rotate on that vertical axis. Then what we need to do, we need to check and see if the player is giving us any input. So we're going to check the value of this move action. And we're going to grab the square magnitude of that. And if that's bigger than say 0 0.1, meaning there is some input coming from the player and the direction square magnitude is also greater than 0 0.1, meaning we're, we're moving. So as long as we're moving and as long as the player is giving us input, we want to be changing our direction that we look. And to do that, I'm going to do this rigid body rotation is equal to the quaternion. Look at our look rotation and we're going to look in the direction and we're going to rotate around vector three up. So quaternions can be confusing and using them even more so, but this is a really great way to be able to control the rotation of our rigid body and tell it which direction to look. Now, if neither of these are happening, if the player's not giving input and we're not moving, uh, we don't want to keep rotating. We want to stop. We don't want to keep doing this floaty rotation bit. So we'll have an else. And in this case, we're going to take the angular velocity of the rigid body and set it to zero. That way we stop rotating. We stop the angular mo momentum. We stop the angular velocity uh, if we're not getting any input. And then before we test this out, we need to add it in to our fixed update function. And we'll add it right at the bottom like that. Then we can go back into Unity and test and see if our issues have been resolved. And I can move around. Notice I'm coming to a stop fairly quickly. I'm not sliding a long distance. I'm also looking the direction I want to look. Now, it's pretty snappy, right? The player turns around effectively instantly, which may or may not be what you want, but it does make for a really responsive player. Um, so that's a little bit up to you and how you want yours to work. So with the basic code working, we want to set up our animations to make this look a little bit better. First thing we need to do is create our animator controller. So I'm going to do that here in an animations folder, create new animation controller, and I'm going to name this third person, third person like so. And I'm going to go to my window and open up my animator window. And I'm going to dock this down here with my input action asset. So what we're going to be doing here, if you're new to the animator and you haven't done a lot of animations, we're not going to go into super detail of how to do this, but what we're going to do is create a blend tree so we can blend between idle, walk, and run, and we get nice, smooth animation. Unity is going to do most of the work for us. So here in the animator, I'm going to right-click, create state, and then from new blend tree. Notice it's orange. This is going to be the default state. This is where we're going to go automatically. And then I'm going to double-click on the blend tree, and it takes me to this layer here and then click on the blend tree node and over in the inspector we're going to add in three new emotion fields and then i'm going to go to my downloads which is where i've put my tiny toony people and they come with animations i'm going to come here to the mail and i can see the names of them here now for whatever reason i'm not entirely sure why i can't drag and drop them but i can see their names here so i'm going to click the little circle and search for male idle, male walk. I have no idea what the difference between male and female is, but they have them. 
and I'm using a male model. So we're going to stick with those. And we've got that. And that sets up our blend tree. It's going to blend between these three values. Now you can see there's a threshold value over here. I'm going to leave this as is for now, but these are the values we're going to be feeding any value into the blend tree. And depending on that value, it's going to blend between these different animations. If I then come back to my player and I'm going to turn my animator on. I turned it off for testing purposes. I then want to drag and drop that third person animator controller into that slot. I can push play. And then if I drag this slider here, you can see that we transition to different animations. We get to kind of a bouncy run, it's kind of a slow walk. And if I leave it all the way off at zero, we just have a really basic idle animation. Before we get to the animation code, we're going to change the name of the parameter. You can see here in the blend tree, we've got this blend. Uh, that's the parameter. I'm going to double click on it over here and change it to speed. Now it's important to note that whatever you type in there is exactly what you're going to have to type in your code. You're typing in a string. So if you get some capitalization or some spacing, copy and paste that directly into your code. It's just worth noting. The next step is to create our uh, animation controlling uh, code. So I'm going to create a new class. I call it third person animation. Now you could put this in as part of your third person controller uh, and that works fine. But the way I'm doing it now, it might be reusable despite the fact that I've named it third person animation. I could potentially put this on some um, uh, NPCs as well so that they have access to this blend tree um, and I can reuse these animations and this controller. So in here, what we need to do is create a few basic variables. The first one is going to be an animator. I'm just going to name it animator. Next one is going to be a rigid body like so. And the last one is going to be uh, a float. This is the max speed. Now with this definition, there is a little bit of a potential issue because I have a max speed now on this piece of code. And I also have one on the third person controller itself. I don't think it's a major issue, but it's worth being aware of that. That's the value should be synced. They do need to be the same value in the start function. We're just going to cache value or cache references to these components. like so. And then in the update, this is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. We're going to set the, take the animator and we're going to set a float. And in this case, we need to type in the value of that parameter. So this is where you're typing in it exactly. Uh, any spacing, any punctuation, well, I probably don't want to use punctuation. Any capitalization is going to go in there. We need to feed it the value for this float. In this case, we're going to take the rigid body velocity. We're going to get the magnitude of it, not the square magnitude. In this case, we want the actual uh, magnitude of velocity or the speed. And then we're going to divide by the max speed. Now, the reason we're dividing by max speed is because that parameter, that threshold in our blend tree went from zero to one. This also means that if you change the maximum speed, so you let your player go faster and faster, we don't have to then go change anything in our animator. It works pretty well. Save that, go back into Unity, come back to my player, and then we'll drag that code on to the player. Now there's a setting up here that you need to be aware of. There's this apply root motion. Mine is unchecked. If yours is checked, you're likely to get some staggering, some stuttering in your player motion. So make sure that that is unchecked. The root motion would allow the animation to actually move the object, which we don't want that to happen. We want the physics engine to be moving our object. So let's go into play mode again. And you can see we're got our nice idle animation. And as I move, I transition into that run animation pretty quickly. But if I move slowly, I walk. So now that we have the basic animations for movement, the idle walk and run, uh, we want to add in animations to allow the player to uh, swing their weapon to attack. And this is going to be a little bit more complicated, but it's not that bad. We need to create an avatar mask. that's going to mask off the arm of our character. So that's the only part that's receiving that attack animation. And we can continue to do our walk and run animations as normal. So I'm going to come back in here to my animations folder and I'm going to create a new avatar mask. Third person attack. So we open up this first tab of the humanoid and we're going to turn off all the parts of our character that we don't want to be controlled by the animation. And in this case, I'm just going to leave the arm, the hand and the IK at the end of the hand. And again, this is what this is going to do is mask it off. So this is the only part of the rig that's being animated by the attack animation. So to make this work, we need to create a new animation layer. I'm going to do that here in our animator. I'm going to hit plus, create a new layer, call it attack. And then because we don't always want to be attacking, I'm going to create a new blank empty state like so. 
And then I'm going to drag in this melee combat animation that came with the tiny toony people pack. And then I'm going to right click to add transitions going towards the combat and then back to this empty state. Then we need to create a new parameter. I'm going to create, create a trigger and I'm going to call this attack like so. And the difference between a trigger and a bool, the trigger, you just set the trigger and it happens. The bool, you got to turn on and off. So the trigger in this case is going to be a lot easier. And then on this transition going to the melee combat, I'm going to click on that. I'm going to add a condition here of attack and I'm going to turn off the exit time. That way we can jump into that animation as quick as we want as soon as the player hits the button. On the other transition, going back to this empty state, we want to leave that transition as is. We don't want to turn off the exit state because then we'll go in and come back out super quick and it's not what we want to do. We want to stay in that uh, melee combat attack animation until it completes. Now, the last thing we need to do, coming back to our layers, hitting the little gear here, we need to give it an avatar mask. So if I hit that dot and come here to the third person attack, you can see I have one from testing earlier, like so. And then we need to turn the weight up. By default, it's set to zero. So if you run it right now, you're not going to see that attack animation at all. I'm going to turn that up all the way to one. And that is good enough to make it work. Go into play mode and we can test this to see how well it's working. So we're sitting there nice and idle. But if I come to my parameters and I toggle my attack, I get that nice attack animation and it doesn't affect the rest of the animation, the rest of the rig. So now what we need to do is get some code that's going to trigger that animation. Now we could create a separate class and attach this as a separate component to our player, but just for simplicity, since we already have access to our input action asset in our player controller or third person controller, I'm going to add in the attack functionality into that class. So to do that, first, what I'm going to do is come up to the on enable and we're going to subscribe to a new event. I'm going to do player action asset, player action map, attack and started and we're going to do do attack i'm going to copy that paste it down onto the on disable and unsubscribe down there then i'm going to have visual studio create this new function for us and just for coherence i'm going to drag it down to the bottom down here i roughly like to have things in the order that either i've created them or the order that they're going to get called so in this do attack function, we're going to need reference to the animator. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to create yet another variable. I'm come up here to the top. I don't need to serialize this one. Animator. Something like that. And then in the awake function, we'll cache a reference to that. Like so. And then our do attack function, back down here at the bottom. Super simple. All we need to do Let's do animator, set trigger, attack. That's it. That's amazing. And again, I think this really shows the power of our new input system, how easy that is to use. So let's go back into play mode here and test and see how well this is working. I can still move around. I can jump. And if I press my button, I get my attack. Now the attack's a little slow, but that has mostly to do with the animation itself. In this last part of the video, we're going to add in Cinemachine to control our third person camera. It's a free asset. Unity bought it a few years back. It is fantastic. The one potential downside is that it has so many knobs and dials. It's easy to get lost and not know exactly what's going on or which knob or button to press. That said, it is super powerful and it is a very quick and easy way to get up and running for third person or other camera types that you might need in a game. So what we need to do here is on our camera object, we're going to add in a Cinemachine brain like so. And this is the object. This always needs to be on the object that's going to be moving. And then we're also going to add in a free look. And that's going to give us that uh, third person camera ability so we can orbit around our player. Now, if we look here, you can see it's gone a little crazy. Uh, and if we look in the game view, it's gone totally crazy. And that's because this follow object and this look at object have not been assigned. So I'm going to drag the player into each of those objects or each of those slots rather. And you can now see in the game view that we've zoomed into our player. Go back to our scene view. You can see what's going on. 
Now, there's these three rings. They might be a little hard to see on YouTube, but you can see these three rings, uh, lower, middle, and upper. And these are the rigs, so to speak. This kind of defines where the camera can move. I don't find the default settings to be great, so I'm gonna make a few changes to this. So down here on the free look component, I'm gonna come down here to where it says top rig, and I'm gonna change these numbers here. I'm gonna change the height to six, the radius to 12, height of this one to four, and six two and four and that just kind of gives us the ability to kind of zoom in we get closer and lower if we zoom out we get higher as well it just feels a little bit better to me most definitely you're going to want to fine tune this yourself now if we go into the game view here we can see a little bit of what's going on here now we've got this blue box and this is the area where the cine where cinema machine is going to try to keep our character inside that blue area. If we get close to the edges, it's going to start moving faster. It's not going to let us get into the red area. Now, this is going to be pretty big and feel a little floaty. So ideally, what you can do is you can drag on these edges here and move it around. I found that to be a little tricky, a little buggy. And I think what's happening is that all of the rigs have their edges on the same area. And so when we're clicking on them, they're not moving. So what you can do if you have that problem, you can come down here to the rigs themselves. So you got these dark boxes. And if we look here, what we're, this blue area is the soft zone. So I can shrink that in like so. And once I do that, I think sometimes you can grab them, sometimes you can't. I have honestly found this a little frustrating and inconsistent. So I'm just gonna use these knobs here and shrink them in. And I'm going to make it fairly tight, like so, try to get it kind of a square. And then I'm going to do the same on the other rig sizes, um, just kind of eyeballing it. You'd want to be a little bit more careful with this if you were making a game, uh, but I think this is good enough for now. There's also adjustments here. You can't see it on the screen because it's set to zero width and zero height. If you change the dead zone, you can make those bigger. What that does is it creates a dead zone where if the player is anywhere in that box, the camera's not going to try to zoom around and find it. It's going to give you a little bit of more freedom, which can be a good feeling depending on what you're looking for. Now, this yellow dot is what the camera is aimed at. Sometimes uh, this works, sometimes it doesn't. You can also go into each of your rigs and adjust the tracking. So maybe you want to move it up a little bit like that. And we'll just type in a one type in one for all of them like that. And then it's going to take some time to compose this. It really depends on the game that you're trying to create. Now, the next thing we need to do is connect our input system with Cinema Machine. And thankfully, this is pretty easy to do as well. I come down here to add component and I'm going to add in Cinema Machine input provider. And here we're going to be able to put in our input actions that correspond to these various axes. So for this third person free look camera, it's just going to be the X and Y axes that have any impact at all. So if I click the dot and I bring this up and what I'm looking for is player look. Now oh, you can see that I have other input action assets. So this is a good point to make sure that you name things well, because you can't really find it very easily other than its name. I'm going to let that go in like so. So that all done, let's give it a quick test. We'll go into play mode. And I'm moving the mouse and my camera moves around. I can use my gamepad, the right stick, and I can control the camera. And if I walk around, the camera follows me. You can see the dead zone there is only assigned to one of the rigs. If I zoom all the way into the lower rig, there is no dead zone. So again, you can really, you can really cut, see the station. You'll notice that this isn't per, uh, preventing any sort of clipping with clipping virus. Uh, that's going to be another can of worms you're going to have to deal with. But that's pretty easy, easy, really quick to create. To other settings that might be useful to look at is the y-axis recentering. So if your camera gets off center or is not directly behind your character and you want it to automatically come back, you can enable that and then play with your weight and recentering time settings there as well. I also feel like sometimes that the uh, input is reversed from what I would expect. I move the mouse left and the camera moves right. You have options here on the X and the Y axes to invert. You can see that the Y is not inverted and the X is, so you can change it there. You can also come back to your input action asset and on the look action, you can go to the processors. There's an invert option here to invert the vector two, or 
I've actually found that the gamepad seems to play pretty nice and go the direction I expect it to, whereas the mouse feels backwards. So you can come to the mouse and just add a processor onto just the mouse action of that binding. So there you go. There's a simple third person controller built with a new input system. Hope that was interesting and better yet useful for you and your project. If it was, check out these other videos that Unity thinks you might want to watch. And until next time, happy game designing.